I'm here tonight because I took a risk. I took a professional and a personal risk. Uh, and if it wasn't somewhat successful, I probably wouldn't be here. But uh, nonetheless, we uh, took a risk. And uh, I want to talk to you tonight about uh, the importance of taking risks and why it's important, especially for healthcare providers and physicians, to take those risks now. Um, the uh, thing with taking risks are, when you do it, you're either successful or not successful. You're either a winner or a loser, or you are, uh, have a gain or a loss. Uh, about 30 years ago, a uh, reporter, Geraldo Rivera, took a big professional risk. Um, Geraldo had the idea that he was going to, on national TV, with a live audience, open Al Capone's vault. The build-up to this was quite uh, exciting. The speculation was wild. What was in the vault? Was there going to be a large sum of cash? Was there going to be jewels and, uh, and artwork? Was it going to be the bodies of Capone's uh, 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 enemies was going to be in there? No one knew. Uh, and so much to Geraldo's embarrassment, when he opened the vault, there was very little in there. Uh, he became for many years kind of a, a joke that uh, Geraldo opening the, opening the vault was a big risk that failed. Um, Geraldo actually said many years later when people reflected on this, he said, I always knew. He said, if there was something there, I would be the toast of the town. But if there wasn't, I would be widely ridiculed. Geraldo, at least up front, knew the inherent sides of taking a risk. Uh, another risk taker that I find just fascinating is Alex Honnold. Alex is the widely regarded as the world's best rock climber. What separates Alex from other rock climbers is Alex climbs with a technique called free soloing. Free soloing means he climbs with no rope and no security uh, gear, no safety gear, just his shoes and his uh, uh, pack on his back for, for, to keep his hands dry. This is Alex climbing up the north face of Half Dome. Uh, let me have another. There he is, actually on the face of Half Dome. This picture is from a documentary he did, Alone on the Wall. And you can see, just from the picture, you get sweaty looking at it. Um, Alex is obvious what his risk is. One slip, one fall, one missed grip, and Alex will plummet 3,000 feet to the floor of Yosemite Valley. The thing with Alex is he is very diligent in his preparation. He will climb his route two or three times with ropes, mapping it out. He knows every crevice, every ledge, every rock on his route up the mountain. But still, he has to step up on the rock with nothing and climb. While none of us take risks maybe to the degree that Alex does, um, we all take risks in life. It's inherent in, in what we do. And sometimes even doing nothing is taking a risk. Sometimes if you don't do something, the missed opportunity passes or something else comes along. So not only is there an active risk that's involved, an active part of risk, but there's also a passive part of risk that's involved. Physicians are notoriously risk averse. We will look at a 2% chance of there being something wrong and order three tests to confirm it. There's a slight chance this biopsy could be positive we will send it to be biopsied. While dealing with cancer or other severe illnesses, this is probably a good plan. But in the rest of life and in the business world, it is not a good way to do things. It's not good in life, it's not good in relationships, it's not good um, for your business. But that is the field and the way we are sort of wired. So we have to look at stepping out a little bit. And once you take a risk, you're never the same you're changed, you either are better or, or worse for it. And we have to kind of get comfortable with that. So in 2013, I took a risk. I left a practice that was busy, that was successful from a very uh, well-known clinic and 
took a, a risk by opening my own practice. Uh, and it was a direct primary care model. Direct primary care models are different from the pr traditional practices in that we don't bill or file insurance or third party and payers. We work directly for our patients, usually with a, a flat monthly fee calling, uh, uh, covering physician services. By doing this, it allows us to offer time with our patients, uh, longer visits, visits outside the office, phone calls, text messaging. We allow us to communicate with our patients the way they communicate with their family members or other friends. And it really opens up some avenues to really connect with our patients. But still, at the time I did that, it was a huge risk because who knew if it would work? Could I make a living? Would patients come? Would they do, engage with me in this model? Um, so that was the risk that I took. Um, and so with that, I want to tell you a little bit my story of how I came to take that risk uh, and what it was like and kind of what, the, uh, what I was feeling and the decisions that I went through. Um, I left Fayetteville after graduating from the University of Arkansas and went to medical school. Uh, in medical school, I learned that in order to be a good physician, you really had to connect with your patients. You had to sit with them. You had to listen to what they had to say. And then by doing so, you could apply what you had learned to help them with their problems, relieve their suffering, make diagnoses. It was really rewarding to be able to connect with patients in that way, especially at a time when they were maybe at their deepest need. Um, or it was at a very difficult time. Uh, this was what medical school was like, and I thought, this is great. This is what I love to do, and I want to do it. So I finished residency and came up here and got the job in Fayetteville that I'd wanted. And, um, found out that private practice in medicine is a little bit different. While you're still interacting with patients, there is a new introduction of other pressures in that doctor-patient uh, environment. Uh, all of a sudden, you had to bill for all your time. There had to be a code applied to it. For some insurance reasons, you had to document and check boxes on a computer screen that uh, didn't have anything to do with what the patient was there for or really any relevance. Um, it was very different in the academic setting where I wasn't being paid. I had all the time and it was to learn, but now it was different. And as you got busier and there was the pressures to see more patients per day, sh shorter visits, less contact with them and less meaningful contact, I became increasingly discouraged. I was at the point of I have to do something different or I'm going to become something that I do not want to be. Um, the fear was that I would become a robot zombie doctor staring at a computer screen <laughs> checking boxes and that in my seven minutes with every patient it would be hi here you go and there was no connection and no interaction. The alternative in that system would be to slow down and take the time but the five or six people who had to wait after you weren't happy when you took that extra time or your billing wasn't as much and you weren't covering your overhead. All of these pressures were brought into the doctor-patient relationship by the third-party payer. Uh, it's the insurance companies that really drive that for systems to be the way they are. Uh, and I think everyone wants to help in the medical system, but then fortunately we have problems that are, that are systems in place that we can't do that very well. Uh, so after much time and uh, Hard soul searching, I uh, submitted my resignation and launched out on a direct primary care model. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that crit critical period, but to say it's been successful is very true. My practice is very much what I hoped it would be. I have 30 minutes to an hour if needed with patients. If we don't need that much, that's fine. We can, we can do less, but if a office visit's required, we can do that. If we can handle the problem via text message or a phone call and that's more convenient for the patient and appropriate, we'll do it that way. But it had to be done in outside of that insurance model to do that. I have patients that I took care of for nine or ten years in my old practice that were blessed for me to come over and follow me in my new practice. After six months of taking care of them in a new model, I knew those patients better than I ever did after taking care of them for nine years. I knew their pets' names. I knew things about them I didn't because I had time to connect and know them. And I'm a better physician to those patients for it. 
Um, but to get there, you had to take the risk of doing something differently. Um, so after I submitted my resignation in uh, 2013, I had done my homework, much like Alex Honnold does his homework on the cliff. Uh, I had, uh, and it felt like that at times, uh, I um, uh, had visited sites of other physicians who were doing it in the area. I did uh, a business model and uh, looked at si uh, office space and how would it work. I launched out. Um, one particular moment from that was it was about two weeks after I'd given my notice and I came home to talk to uh, my biggest supporter, my wife Stacy. In fact, Stacy was the one who said, hey, you ought to check this model out. I think you could practice like this. And I said, okay. And that was, she was the first person that, that uh, uh, made me aware of direct primary care. Um, so I came home with cold feet because somebody had said it won't work or the eighth person in a row said, no, I'm going to stay in the conditional system and said, I got to go talk to my partners. I got to go beg for my job back. This is never going to work. And she said something to me as she usually does. It was direct, but very encouraging and said, do you believe in the model that you're wanting to do? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, do you want to do it? And I said, yes, I do. She said, well, buckle up and do it. Um, it may have been a little different than that, but it was pretty similar to that. But it was true. It was a cold feet moment that I realized I was still having regret, or, or not regret for doing it, but at cold feet and anxious. But it was a moment that after that point, I never doubted this is what I was going to do. This was the path I was going to take. And it has paid huge dividends uh, for me and for my patients. Um, one critical thing for me that, uh, it was a book that I read during that time, and it was by uh, Brene Brown, it was called Daring Greatly. And in that book, she talks about how you have to be vulnerable to, to uh, take risk in life and to live life, actually. The title of the book comes from Theodore Roosevelt's uh, very famous speech, uh, commonly referred to as the man in the arena. He delivered it in uh, April of 1910 at the Sorbonne in Paris. And the most quoted part I'll talk about or paraphrase a bit, but he talks about, he said, it's the critic doesn't matter. It's not the critic who counts, but it's the man in the arena with dust on his face and sweat on his face and blood on his face who spends his effort in something of value that if he is successful, knows the triumph of great achievement, but if he fails, he fails knowing he dared greatly and that he will never have his place with the timid souls who never ventured any effort at all. And so with that, I want to say, physicians and healthcare givers, we need to dare greatly for ourselves, for our professions, and for the people, our patients, our people we give our care to. Because what we do is too important to not. So my challenge to y'all tonight is to go and take that risk and dare greatly. Thank you.